Delightful salads that don't disappoint. Let's put the yum back in salads. This is the Happy Diabetic Kitchen, the podcast about people who love to eat and cook healthy. This is your guide to the world of healthy cooking and conversations about happy diabetic living and lifestyles, where we simply turn ordinary ingredients into something extraordinary. Welcome to the kitchen, and let's get cooking. Hello, everyone. I am Chef Robert Lewis, the Happy Diabetic, and this is the Internet's Most Delicious Cooking Podcast. Welcome to the Happy diabetic kitchen. We are getting ready to explore a healthy diabetic lifestyle. I want to take the mystery out of healthy cooking, explore some amazing foods, and share with you my diabetic journey with all my successes and all my challenges. So if you're new to the show, I'm so happy that you're here. And with me in the kitchen, as always, is my son, Jason, our engineer, producer of the podcast, and my partner in crime, through this whole journey. Hey, Jace, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? Awesome. Well, hey, Thanksgiving is now behind us, and um, it was a great time together. Did you uh, did you eat anything especially good this Thanksgiving? Mm, too many, too many things. I hear you. Um, the one thing we didn't eat enough of was any soup or salad. So I just thought we would get right into the podcast and talk a little bit about Salads and soups. So this is a two-part podcast. Our first part will be all about salads starring microgreens, along with a very special guest, the owner of Little Indian Micro Farms, a boutique microgreen farm here in the Midwest. And then in part two, we'll be talking about soups of love. So we'll look at the foundations of building great soup, And great salads. And hey, I I think we should just get into it. What do you think, Jace? Yeah, let's do it. So in today's podcast, we'll be talking about delightful salads that don't disappoint. Let's put the yum back in salads. And we're going to make microgreens the new star of our salad. We're going to talk about a different kind of recipe for the podcast I think you'll like. Some helpful hints about salads. I also want to chat very briefly about a new product from Zerus pharmaceuticals that I'm involved with, and much, much more. So hey, let's turn the oven on and let's get cooking. Delightful salads that don't disappoint. Let's put the yum back in salads. So I think the first reason salads always seem to disappoint me is because of the lettuce. And it's usually a lettuce bowl filled with this iceberg lettuce. You know the kind, Jason? Round head, really green. Sure. Kind of not really too green, but kind of pale green, crunchy, no flavor, right? I mean, so typical of salads in America to use iceberg lettuce. I mean, after all, the Titanic did hit an iceberg, yeah. and um, this is what it always reminds me of. Tasteless, just nothing lettuce. So unless you want your salad to taste like bottled water, let's do something different than iceberg lettuce. So I recommend let's use a variety of greens for a more interesting flavor and texture. Now, lots of herbs, lots of vegetables for amazing flour. So let's chat about lettuce. First of all, You don't have to settle for those pale, limp pieces of green lettuce when you have a salad. But before you buy, I would always suggest you purchase lettuce that hasn't been pre-cut or processed. But listen, I know because I'm a busy guy, it's hard to deny the convenience of pre-packaged greens. I mean, I've bought those salad packets. Jason, have you ever had those? Like... um, Caesar salad comes with the dressing and everything. Sure, yeah. They're not bad. Yeah. I mean, they have its place. They're certainly convenient. But if you want to elevate your salad eating 
let's do it and let's start with the lettuce. So let me just give you a few brief definitions. There is lettuce called crisp head. Now, crisp head or what they call the iceberg lettuce that sank the Titanic is probably best known lettuce in U.S. It's the cheapest. It's found in every grocery store. It's usually eaten raw in salads and sandwiches, shredded tacos, taco salads, or the classic wedge salad, but not much flavor. So then we're going to move on to romaine. Now, if you've ever had a Caesar salad, you know all about romaine, right? And just it's long, crisp, pale green leaves sporting crunchy micro ribs. Romaine, particularly the, the lighter leaves towards the center, the heart, are the most flavorful than any other variety that I know of. And you can also find romaine hearts packaged in your local grocery store, pre-cleaned, uh, pre-trimmed, and that's really good. So romaine is sturdy. Now, Jason, have you ever had grilled romaine lettuce? Ooh, I can't say that I have. Yeah, I, I mean, I just don't know if lettuce should ever be grilled. A lot of people do it, grilled Caesar salads. It doesn't do much for me. I love it just mixed with other lettuces or with crunchy apples, pears, and nuts. You can even make a really great holiday lettuce salad with that. So romaine is really my go-to. Dark greens, really good. Another variety is called loose leaf. Now, loose leaf has large, open, ruffled leaves, kind of a slightly nutty flavor. Uh, the leaves are tender, and it's commonly available in red or green varieties. Um, very delicious. The heads are typically smaller, and you can use the leaves as is. But for larger heads, we recommend tearing the leaves into bite-sized pieces. Very loose, very flavorful, very tender, Again, look for that red and green varieties. Another great lettuce, if you can imagine now, we're mixing romaine, we're mixing loose leaf. How about we mix in some what we call butterhead? Now, butterhead lettuce forms a very loose head featuring soft, smooth texture, red tinge or pale green leaves that become lighter towards the center. Boston bib, uh, Boston lettuce, bib lettuce, um, these are the very typical types of butterhead lettuces. They're very mild, and they're very sweet, and they're very delicious. I like to use that variety, the butterhead, like the, the um, Boston or the bib. I like to use it in like chicken lettuce wraps, like a Thai chicken lettuce wrap. So light, so delicate. Really, it's just an amazing lettuce that will definitely change your lettuce eating habits. So imagine for a moment, let's just review. We've got some romaine. We've not used any uh, iceberg lettuce, although if you wanted to put 10% in, certainly could. But I'm using mostly romaine, loose leaf, and butterhead lettuce. And then I'm going to kick it up with some herbs. Basil, an obvious choice with fresh leaves. Tarragon has that licorice undertones. Great flavor with parsley and chives. Italian parsley, which is a softer, fatter leaf than the typical parsley you always got as a garnish, gets along well with most herbs. It's fresh, lightly bitter, lending balance to any dish it joins. I also love cilantro, which you will find uh, cilantro is kind of soapy, but it can also bring citrus-like bitterness and some really gentle bitterness to your salad. I also love dill heavenly when mixed with mint. It's really great also with basil and tarragon. Any combination of these herbs in a salad are just going to bring it all back to life. So those are just some of my tips. Now, you know, when making a salad, I think one of the most amazing add-ons ever is a microgreen. So if I'm looking for that flavorful, dark, leafy greens with great flavor, a light vinaigrette, and just as a side note, and I'll post this up on my website, but my go-to vinaigrette would be three parts olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, one part balsamic vinegar, a little Dijon mustard, a little salt, a little pepper, a little brown sugar just to, to cut the acidity, shake it up really nice, and you have a very beautiful fresh vinaigrette. Of course, some nice croutons on top, some carrots on top would be very good, cherry tomatoes, green peppers, 
sliced red onions. I mean, you can just let your imagination absolutely go wild on all the different ingredients. But again, not to sound like a broken record, I think once you change your lettuce, you're going to find salads to be much more interesting. And of course, one of my favorite add-ons ever are microgreens. And in just a moment, we're going to have an interview with one of my favorite microgreen farmers in the Midwest. So stay tuned, and we'll be back for that interview. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Happy Diabetic Kitchen Podcast. I'm your host, Chef Robert Lewis, here in the kitchen with Jason and our uh, kitchen mascot, Scout and Cubby. But I have a very special guest in the kitchen today, Shauna Davis. Shauna, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Never had it so good. So, Shauna, I have to ask you a question. Are you sure. ready to get happy? I am always ready to get happy. Awesome. Definitely. Well, let me, t- let me tell you a little bit about Shauna, and then I'm going to have her fill in the blank. She uh, is a small business owner. She specializes in organic microgreens and vegetables and plants. And one of the things I'm really impressed about Shauna is that she grows super high-quality, fresh produce and really takes care of the earth and the land and I think just grows an incredible product, which we want to talk about, microgreens. So, um, Shauna, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the intro. (laughs) You're very welcome. So happy to have you. So why don't you fill in the blanks for all the happy diabetics out there um, listening? I mean, they'd be very interested in learning some of the health benefits, but why don't you just kind of tell us a little bit about what you do? Sure, sure. So we are uh, small-scale urban farmers. We are a micro farm, and it consists of farming on less than five acres. And so we can produce quite a bit of fruit and vegetables, and the microgreens, of course, on our farm. So pretty much what our concept is is that we were thinking that we would like to farm in a way that is extremely sustainable. And by that, um, you know, leaving our soils chemical-free, um, using companion planting, and, you know, bringing in beneficial insects instead of using pesticides. And, mm-hmm. and of course, the microgreens, which are a year-round product that we can supply to people that is extremely nutritious. For example, microgreens are about 40% more nutritional, well, up to 40% more nutritional value than a full-grown counterpart. So if we were to take a, a, a broccoli, for example, which is a harder vegetable to grow as well. So if Somebody was growing in their in their backyard, we'll say, for example. If they were growing the, the broccoli, it's, it's a harder one to grow, and you can only grow it at certain times of the year because it is a cool-weather crop. However, if we were to grow broccoli microgreens, we can do this on a weekly basis. So, And they do contain uh, 50% more nutritional value than their full-grown co- counterparts. So they're, like, concentrated. They, they are. Like they are. We, we do a lot of superfoods, better nutrition, you know, for you. And, and we need you to get all your all your all your goodness out of these these foods because there is medicine in our food as opposed to going with pharmaceuticals. So you know, and and with you doing being the happy diabetic, I wanted to kind of talk about that broccoli a little bit more as well because for diabetes, this is one of the superfoods that you would want to eat. It has something called sephoraphane, which is a chemical that is found in the broccoli and it's an antioxidant. It's found in, in most of the brassica families of vegetables, such as cabbage and Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, et cetera, mm-hmm. um, which we, we grow all of those to full grown, but we also grow those as a microgreen. But so what the, what the antioxidants will do, they will help to fight the free radicals, which are unstable molecules that cause cell damage in your body. And so with the sephoraphane, it helps to reduce blood sugar levels and improve your blood sugar control. So, which is great for people with diabetes. So that was was one of the ones that I was really wanting to discuss today because it is just so incredibly good for you. So that's really interesting. So let me ask you this question: sure. Is there more benefit to eating it raw than cooked? I mean, Absolutely. Or is- you cook your food, you're essentially cooking out some of the chemical compounds uh, that are in the foods that are a benefit to you. So if you're if, say that you are cooking your broccoli in a, a we'll use a stir fry for example. If you were cooking your broccoli in a stir fry, you're going to lose a lot of these nutrients that are just so incredibly good for you. Um, so anything fresh is, is better than than a cooked product. 
However, with that being said, some people have issues in the digestive tract where they have to have cooked vegetables. So it's kind of a catch-22 for people in that kind of a situation. So unfortunately, you might lose some of your nutritional value. But with the microgreens, I highly encourage it always to be fresh. Right. And, and that's, that's, the, that's the idea behind them is to have the highest nutrient content with the freshest quality. I tell people all the time, try to eat foods that are close to the earth, less exactly. processed. Exactly. And, and certainly, you know, fruits and vegetables and microgreens and broccoli fit that mm-hmm. description beautifully. So, so thanks for sharing that. that that's, sure. I think that's, that was a home run right there for me. Interview's <laughs> over. Okay, got everything I need. <laughs> That's it. We're out of so, here. <laughs> yeah. So um, how did you get started in urban farming? I mean, how did you get started growing microgreens? Take take me through that. So I I gardened my whole life. My my grandparents have all had them. You know, my mother's been a uh, an enthusiast as well. So I, I've kind of grown up with that. So I had a little bit of a head start. <laughs> but getting into the microgreens, we, we actually started farming and, and we were – feeding our neighbors and feeding people and our families, and and it just kept kind of growing for us. And so then we kept coming across these things like the microgreens that people hadn't seen before here in the Midwest, which, you know, I mean, the microgreens have been big in bigger cities for, you know, 20-plus years. Uh, You know, in in California, for example, you know, there are leaders in, in what's our revolutions of what happens throughout the country. And so... We had come across microgreens in some of our research because we'd like to be able to have, like I was saying, fruits and vegetables that people don't see as much, that have a higher nutrient content or, you know, it's just all around a, a better product for you. Take a, We can take a purple vegetable, for example. When we first do, started doing, like, purple carrots, people were like, what, a purple carrot? Well, yeah, all purple vegetables have a higher content of nutrition in them. And this is something that people didn't know. And so once, like I was saying, through our research, we were finding the microgreens. And so we started growing for our own personal benefit. And then the more I was talking with people, and nobody knew what they were. This was about three years ago. Nobody knew what they were. So I said, well, you know, maybe we should start educating and, and kind of getting this out there to the public because they just don't know. So that's kind of where we started going with that and, and started doing farmer's markets. And then I do different demonstrations at, at some of the health markets around here in hy V and just educating people and trying to get them healthy. And, and once again, I want to come back to medicines in our food, you know, right. as opposed to having to go through these, these pharmaceutical companies. So that's right. kind of where we, we went with it. And it's just kind of grown since then. And, and then, I've you know, I've noticed that more people know what they are from several of us, us microgreen growers in the in the area have been educating. And so now more people know what it is. So it's less education and more about giving them a very good, high quality, fresh product. So Shauna, for those that are listening, describe microgreen. Sure, sure. So microgreens are just essentially vegetable and herb seedlings. We get them and harvest them before they get their first set of true leaves. So the difference between them and sprouts would be that sprouts are grown in water and they don't get their their leaves on them. Oh, Microgreens okay. actually get a set of leaves on them. So that's kind of the difference. Okay. Yeah. That was going to be a question I had because I love like sprouts, <laughs> but I know that sprouts and microgreens are definitely different. They um, are. They are. What can you grow as a microgreen? Oh, my goodness. There are so many different varieties. Um, I mean, so could I assume you could grow carrot as a microgreen? We grow carrot as a microgreen. It's got a milder carrot flavor, so it's not as potent and strong. But carrot would be one of the ones that we would put in with a mix with other things to bring out flavors together. Um, we do Brussels sprouts and cabbage and broccoli and see carrot, onion, mostly anything you can really – think of, for the most part, you can grow as, okay. as a microgreen. And what do you typically and, grow them in? I mean, so we, is it like a soil or a compost? Or? Yep, so we do soil. I'm a firm believer in the natural process of things. So naturally, they grow in soil. However, you can grow them hydroponically. I don't because I just don't feel that it's the natural way of things. Right. Not, that, not that there's anything wrong with it <laughs> by any means. But, yeah, we, so we grow indoors. 
um, we grow in 10 by 20 trays. And they're a shallow tray so that you're using a lot less dirt so that we can keep our prices as cheap as possible. We like people to be, eat healthy at affordable rates. It's right. very important to us because, I mean, if you look at the organic movement, prices are still pretty high, you know. And so we try to keep them comparable to, let's say, our grocery stores. There's, there are several different varieties that you can do and, and grow and and grow them, they take about a week, some of them. Uh, some of the herbs that we grow, such as a dill or a cilantro or a fenugreek, uh, would take a little bit longer. So some of those are two-week growers. You, you're able to get a harvest off them. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And, and I do know, I'm not an expert, um, I only play one on TV, but I do know <laughs> that many, if not, well, I shouldn't say many, but all of these microgreens, like you stated earlier, have amazing nutritional uh, benefits. Yep, yep. And, you know, something I'd like to bring up with that is uh, we grow an amaranth. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's it's a very beautiful pinkish-red microgreen. It does take us two weeks. However, amaranth, when it's grown out to full form, it's still a superfood. It's considered a superfood. So I'm wondering if it would be grown out as a microgreen if we'd consider it a super, super superfood. (laughs) <laughs> I think it would be. Right, and right. You, yeah, and you mentioned fenugreek, right? So yes. So that has some very interesting properties uh, that people think are very healthy for diabetics. Yes, and fenugreek, I am I am a huge supporter of this herb. Um, it's actually uh, native to uh, the Mediterranean region, and it kind of smells and tastes a little bit like maple syrup, although okay. I find it to have a little bit more of a bitter flavor. But fenugreek mm-hmm. is amazing, and, and anybody out there is more than welcome to research it because it's got so many good properties that I just couldn't even list them all right now. Yeah. But, I mean, anywhere yeah. from stomach issues to arthritis and thyroid and obesity and Parkinson's and, and right. even for skin and baldness. And um, So when you're using it for diabetes, the idea with it is slows absorption of the sugars into the stomach and it helps to stimulate insulin. So it's one of the, the probably top microgreen that we grow that I would suggest for anybody with diabetes or, or any, any other ailment as well. It's just right. an all-around great, great herb. I was going to also bring up, um, we do a sunflower microgreen, which is, has a nutty, nutty flavor to it. Ooh, yeah. And it is one, probably one of the most nutritious all-around complete uh, microgreen, or I guess it's a shoot. We won't call it a microgreen. It's more of a shoot it's, that we grow. So sunflower is another one that I highly recommend. Sell them live and I sell them um, cut. So I do cut them and package them. With the microgreen, once you cut any kind of vegetable or anything, they start to decompose, I guess we'll say. So the fresher, right. the better. So if we were to go to the farmer's market, we do them a lot on Saturdays and Sundays during the summer, and I always harvest on a Friday so that we have the freshest, most nutritious product that we could have. But they do have about a 5, 10-day limit on them, just depending on, on the variety, because what we're, what we're looking for is keeping that high nutritional value. So once they're cut, you're going to start losing nutrition. So we want to keep it at optimum nutritional value. So I do sell them that way, which I package them in containers. And then I also sell them as a live food source so that you cut and you get the freshest quality you could, which I do those, like I said, in soil. But there's other people that do grow on mat. So if I was to buy the live microgreen, in, however, how would I store that? And what's how long will it live for? I would say storage would be keeping it very cool. Because we want a slow growth at that point. I, would, I wouldn't I would put it over maybe a week before you really need to harvest it out, and then you have a week or so after that. If you're not able to eat it right away, I mean, say that you took a larger tray and you were not you were only able to get through halfway, before it starts to get overgrown and then we start losing that nutrition, you can you can cut it back and, and store it in your refrigerator. So here's a term that you used a couple times, sustainable farming. What, what does that really mean? So with our sustainable farming, which is so important to us, um, it's about not making a harmful impact upon the earth. When we, when we consider sustainable farming, we recycle, we use 
companion planting. We use com we compost for our um, nutrition for our soils. We also do worm composting that helps to to kind of boost that up as well, and it's a faster process so you can get your right. your soil out there. But it, yeah, it's all just about being in harmony with what is actually going on. And it, sustainable farming is a lot like organic farming. You know, just kind of different names. I mean, I try to buy organic whenever I can. Right, it isn't right. It's always possible, but certainly if you can, I would highly recommend it. Right, right. And and it's about getting it to be affordable. You right. know, and that's what that's what all these is kind of doing as they've shifted over to going organic so that you don't have pesticides and chemicals and you're getting all this extra ickiness that your body right. is not equipped for essentially. Right. So yeah, right. they, they prices are starting to come down but they still are are quite expensive sometimes I've noticed. Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. you know and, and that's another reason that we started growing is because of how expensive it was. Yeah, it's costly. It, it is costly. It can get very costly if you're eating an all organic diet. And it's it's difficult and and you know I think that the cost needs to come down so significantly so that people that are, are not financially set, I guess, can also eat that way. And that's what we're we're trying to do, and, and especially with the farmer's markets, you know. Like I said, I we keep our prices very comparable to, to some of these big box stores. Right, right. Shauna, it's just great having you in the neighborhood. Uh, well, thank you. So, I, and thanks for being on the show. I really appreciate it. So, thanks so much for being in the kitchen. It, it was really great having you here. Now, the world is listening, and what would you like our listeners to know about Shauna Davis and your microgreen farm? Sure. So, we are Little Indian Micro Farm. Uh, we do several farmers markets throughout the Quad Cities in the summertime. We're hoping to get to new locations this year as we're we're expanding and growing and 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 getting into different things. But you can also find us, I do have a Gmail address if anybody has any questions. It would be littleindianmicrofarm at gmail.com. We also are on Facebook if anybody would like to look us up there and have questions, and we're always more than welcome to help. So where, where if I lived in, in my area, where would I come find you to buy microgreens? If I woke up tomorrow and wanted some microgreens, where would I go? Sure. So I have several local areas um, that that deal with our product, and they're small business as well. So I would encourage people to help support small business and your local businesses. Um, Yeah. So uh, Healthy Harvest, that is in Rock Island. They have uh, different kinds of produce, and they're a plant-based cafe as well. And then we are also sold at Heritage Natural Foods in Moline. We're working on getting another location in Iowa for Heritage Natural Foods. That way we have our Iowa people that can not have to drive clear to Illinois. (laughs) Not that it's all that far. (laughs) But still, you know, it's a little more convenient for people. And then we also sell at Hy-Vee located off of John Deere Road on 7th Street in Moline. Yep. Otherwise, the area farmer's markets, we do Freight House Farmer's Market in the summer. Uh, We do them Saturdays and Sundays. And then Wednesdays. We do East Moline Farmer's Market, which is located at Skate City. And then on okay. Sundays, we also do Port Byron at their Farmer's Market. So a couple of the different ways that I use microgreens, I do them in salads, of course. I okay. do them on sandwiches. I have a wonderful mix that's called a sandwich mix that's actually mustard and dill together and a couple other things. But they just really complement one another. We, I do a baked potato um, I've done them. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I I put them on pizzas. I mean, so you know, really, your imagination's the limit. Um, but always, always use fresh. Yeah, always use fresh. Absolutely. Yep. And one yep. of the things I wanted to ask you about, and, and thank you for sharing those suggestions, because sure. I've tasted your taco. I think you call it your street taco mix. Yes. So tell tell everybody a little bit about that, because I think the idea of <laughs> Mixing microgreens to create a flavor profile is... Absolutely, and I, that was one of the things that I didn't see anybody doing because people want to sell the live microgreens a lot. And so when we do a mix, they, um, some of them don't grow well together, so we have, we have to cut them and mix them because you just couldn't take a tray of them together because right. they, just don't, they just don't play well together. 
And so, um, like with the with the street taco mix, it's one of our high end mixes, which is absolutely delicious. But it's a cilantro. We do leek. We do a radish, a cabbage, and something called chiso. Now chiso is a, like I'm going to call it an oriental. It's an oriental herb, kind of kind of a green. Mm-hmm. Um, it's used in salads and stir fries and whatnot. But it has a very very distinct flavor, which is a, kind of like a cinnamony, cuminy, licoricey taste to it, and it complements the street taco mix so greatly that it, it is a it just turns it into this high end beautiful mix. Shana, thank you for being on the show. Um, it was a delight having you, and it was thank a delight you. meeting you a couple of weeks ago. And oh, I just look forward to eating more healthy microgreens. And of course, I'm really feeling inspired now to go to my local market to buy some broccoli. Wonderful, wonderful. And usually, so, usually our sandwich mixes will contain the broccoli. Um, so if you're wanting to get a bunch of flavor and and to get high nutrition, the sandwich mix is the way to go. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, stay on the line, Shana, because we are sure. going to come back with our Happy Diabetic Kitchen Rapid Fire 411 game. Oh, goodness. <laughs> All right. Here we go. So welcome back, everybody. It's time for the Rapid Fire 411 with our little Indian micro farm uh, grower of the world, Shauna. Are you ready to play? I am. So here's what's going to happen, Shauna. I will ask you a series of rapid fire questions, and you simply choose your preference. For example, I might say something like butter or olive oil, riding a bike or hiking, that kind of thing, and you pick your favorite. Are you ready to go? I Here am. Sounds fun. <laughs> Olive oil or butter? Olive oil. Baked or fried? Uh, baked. Waffles or pancakes? Pancakes. Beef stew or grilled steak? Grilled steak. Okay. Chunky or smooth peanut butter? Chunky. Wow. Me too. <laughs> Valentine's Day or St. Patrick's Day? St. Patrick's Day. Are you a morning person or a night owl? A morning person. Okay. Favorite vegetable? Probably carrots. Carrots? Okay. Yeah. Puppies puppies or kittens? Puppies. Bacon or ice cream? Ice cream. Okay. Coffee <laughs> or tea? Mm, that's a hard one. Coffee. Superhero or supervillain? Superhero. Do you love or hate roller coasters? I love roller coasters. Okay. I hate <laughs> roller coasters. Do okay. You? Well, finally. <laughs> here we go. Finally. John, okay. you can have dinner and serve your amazing microgreens to anyone, past or present, who might it be? Hmm. I would probably go with, hmm, that's a hard one. I would say Steve Irwin. Steve Irwin. Steve? Yes. The alligator dude? Yes. <laughs> wow. Interesting. Yeah. So I, I, mean, I admire I him. That. You admire him? <laughs> I okay. do. I do. Well, he's, yeah. he's an animal person, and I'm an animal person, and, okay. and you know, yeah. That was a great answer. I love that one. <laughs> Shana, thanks again for being on the show. It was a delight. Thank you. And, I had uh, fun. Listen, no one loves you more than me. Have a great <laughs> rest of your day. Oh, thank you. Take care. Okay, take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Be sure to follow me on all my social links. You'll find them all at happydiabetic.com. Just look for all my links at the top right-hand side of the page. Join the party. Join the conversation. We'd love you to join in. I want to chat with you briefly about a product I'm super proud about that I was involved in uh, from a marketing standpoint. It's from Xeris Pharmaceuticals from Chicago. 
It's called Gvoke, G-V-O-K-E. It's the first ready-to-use stable liquid glucagon. Now, Gvoke is a ready-to-use room temperature stable liquid glucagon that's used in the treatment of severe hypoglycemia. That's people like me, type 1, type 2, like you, who have very severe low blood sugars. It's an injectable, pre-mixed, ready-to-use, in-a-packet injectable. It's also available in a pediatric form and also for adult patients, and especially people ages two years and above that who have diabetes. Ask your doctor, ask your pharmacist about it. It's an amazing treatment for those low glycemic events when you just have to have an injection opposed to alternative ways that are available in the market. It's called Gvoke by Xerus Pharmaceuticals. It is available at your local pharmacy. Ask your doctor about it. See if that's a product ready for you. If you're loving what you hear in the kitchen, please leave a comment or feedback at Stitcher, Google Play, or Apple Podcast, or wherever you're listening. Your thoughts and comments are all very appreciated. Again, thanks for tuning in. We're happy to have you in the Happy Diabetic Kitchen. Our podcast is produced and engineered by Jason Lewis. Our theme music by the Happy Diabetic Kitchen Band, and of course, yours truly, Chef Robert on the electric guitar. And of course, our diabetic kitchen mascots, Scout and Tucker, who at last appearance were napping. Hmm. Well, listen, thanks for tuning in. And let me leave you with this thought. Julia Child once said, cooking well doesn't mean cooking fancy. Well, so long for now. And remember, no one loves you more than me.